you're a Zen master, but you're also connected to the Integral School, Ken Wilber, and this this idea of sort of developmental lens, looking at culture and looking at consciousness through a very through the sense of where it's going and how it's developing. So it's a very interesting mix of the sort of the timeless Zen and the developmental path of consciousness. And we're going to I'm going to open by asking you a little bit about Jordan Peterson, um, at the risk of feeling that all of the content and all of our channel is about Jordan Peterson. I think it's, uh, I think the reason for that is because I think it's a really interesting window into some of the deeper topics that I'm really hoping to, to explore with you about masculine and feminine and, and where we are culturally. Because I think the phenomena of Jordan Peterson and the reaction to him, for me at least, says something really archetypal about where we are in our culture. Um, so I'd love to hear what yeah, just what you made of this this incredible kind of phenomena that's erupted over the last kind of year or so. I was so excited to see Jordan Peterson erupt onto the stage. And I know you had particular part in that. There is a culture war that is in bright precedence. I mean, we are in the middle of a culture war. There's a polarization and Jordan Peterson is standing in the middle as a lightning rod, taking all the projections from both sides. He clearly sees the postmodern ideology and it is an ideology. It's a system of beliefs and values that will not lead us to the promised land. It is, it is problematic. It leads us into a swamp with no exit. It is not sustainable. He sees it very clearly. And in my opinion, he sees it from a modern perspective. Very brilliant modern perspective. He's, he's, and he has a depth because of his understanding of Carl Jung and his own work in psychology, the field of psychology, that is deeper than most people. So people are drawn to that depth. He sees something much deeper than other people are seeing right now. For me, when I see him describing this ideology of postmodern egalitarian relativism and describing it so precisely, and then I listen to Ken Wilber describing the same disease, there are some interesting differences between their two descriptions. And there are even more interesting similarities. <laughs> Jordan Peterson has the depth of Jung's perspective, and Ken has that too. He studied Jung and Neumann, but he has a much bigger philosophical view that is a little bit more evolved, passed into the integral realm. But the two perspectives are fascinating to me, and both of them are critical. The antidote, the medicine for the, the, the post-modernity, I believe Ken sees, and I'm not sure Jordan Peterson does. And Ken has a name for this. He calls it a perspectival madness. And it is madness. There's no way out. Our, the culture war in our, our society, Western, postmodern society, at war with modern beliefs and traditional beliefs is a psychosis. So this a perspectival madness is kind of best summarized as this idea there is no truth and yet that is a truth. That's part of it. That's the, um, the nihilism, the, the relativistic nihilism which is saying there is no absolute truth and that's an absolute truth. Everything's relative and that's absolutely true. That's crazy making. That's half of it. The other half of it is rampant narcissism. If there is no absolute, if there is no power greater than my ego, what am I going to worship? 
As Ken points out, there are studies that show that I'm a member of the me generation, narcissistic, 60s. The people today, the millennials, are two and a half times more narcissistic than the me generation. That just breaks my heart open. There's no way out of that. No way out. And when I work with the millennials, it breaks my heart. I feel such compassion. First of all, everybody's lied to them. Everybody's told them what they believe is the truth. And no one's told them the truth. It's really interesting that you're, that you're talking about compassion there. Because I'd say there's two, there's two things. Firstly, the difference, I think, with, with Ken Wilber's attitude towards what he calls the broken green. And, and that this maps on to what Jordan Peterson would describe as sort of the postmodern um, neo-Marxist worldview. Is that Ken seems to see it as a necessary stage of development. And I get the sense with Jordan Peterson that he's so, he rejects it so much that he, he doesn't see it as a necessary stage at all. He just sees it as a complete wrong turn in society. But the other, the other point is that you mentioned compassion for the people who are stuck in this. This is where I have a, where I have a difficulty with, with Jordan Peterson is that I don't feel that compassion for, from him a lot of the time. He, he attacks it so strongly that I don't feel... Whereas I, I would like, what I would like to see a bit more from him is this sense of these people are, have been misdirected, they've been misguided, and a sense of sort of almost like fatherly kind of concern for them as much as we need to eradicate this kind of worldview, it's wrong, it leads to the gulag, da 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 um, Which is interesting, maybe that's the Zen compassion that you're bringing in. It, it is partially Zen, but it's partially the second tier perspective. It's partially what lies beyond green. I'm not convinced that green is a bridge to the next level of consciousness. It may be. And just to interject here for our audience who may not know what green is, what is, is the level of consciousness that evolved or emerged more fully during the 60s and is characterized by relativism, by postmodernism, all these things. It, it's actually bringing to the table some really critical ingredients. Whether green is the end of an epoch or a bridge to the next epoch is not clear yet. There are some developmental theorists that say green is not really a stage of development at all. It's a half stage. It's not clear. It's not like modernity. Postmodernity is kind of confused and not really possible to emerge as a full-blown stage of development. Because it's self-contradictory? Because it's got inherent contradictions in it. There's no way out of it. It may be a dead end. It may be the end of this epoch rather than the beginning of the next one or the transition to the next one. But if it's the end, that's a transition too, isn't it? <laughs> it's not clear. Robert Keegan is such a developmental theorist. He doesn't see this postmodern as a stage of development. He sees it more as a symptom. Um, it's just not clear yet. We, don't, we won't know for a while. We won't know till we're looking back from the other side. So we'll see. So I'm right in the middle between Wilbur and Jordan Peterson mm. because I, I, I had read Carl Jung's collected works by the time I was 24. The, the Jungian perspective was really important to me. And then I stumbled into Zen and I stun, stumbled into Ken. It's probably a really good time to just get a, a brief potted history of your of your background. How did you, how do you come to be um, a Zen master with the integral tradition. I was raised Roman Catholic, a German Roman Catholic, in a small farming community in the mountains of Colorado. I didn't fit in. I had my first direct experience of God, head, or emptiness very young. And many more. 
And when I went to talk about them, I was beaten by the clergy, the nuns. They were particularly mean. <laughs> so I very quickly learned to not say anything. But I wasn't very good at it, so I kept saying things. I kept conflicting. So by the time I was 17, I was very rebellious and deeply disturbed. I'm lucky to be alive. <laughs> I'm lucky to have survived such pent-up anger and frustration and, um, and stubbornness. So I met a woman, a teacher. One of my friends drugged me to meet this woman. And I knocked on her door. We had to be there at exactly 8 o'clock. Drove two hours to get there. And this white-haired woman with fire in her eyes opened the door. And she said, Welcome. No one comes here by chance. We're guided by the unconscious. Because the unconscious knows. So this was like putting a, a key, like Jordan Peterson talks about putting a key in a hidden lock and something opens. I had felt this before when I was very young and I learned that trust in the Lord because the Lord knows. It's the same lock. <laughs> Different key, but the same lock. Something opened then too. All of a sudden, this really confused 17-year-old was not alone. There was a whole group of, of people that teacher introduced me to that I began to read with a voracious appetite. Carl Jung, Eric Neumann, Joseph Campbell, uh, D.T. Suzuki, Krishnamurti, Miriak Iliade, uh, Herman Hesse, Watts. A world opened and, and I fell into it. I started meditating about the same time. And I, there was a, an image and a words that came out of nowhere, as if from the top of the mountain. I was worried about, well, what am I going to do when I grow up? And all of a sudden, these words boomed out of nowhere. Rather than finding your place in the world, first find yourself, and there will be your place. Here I am, a so-called master of Zen, a lineage holder in Rinzai Zen, Samurai Zen. <laughs> <laughs> How perfect is this? And I, I had read Jung's work by the time I was 24. I think like Jung thinks. I see the same things Jung saw, the movement of collective shadows, what I see happening right now breaks my heart open. Nobody else sees what I see. Jordan Peterson smells it, I suspect, but it doesn't sound like he sees it. What do you see? I'd rather not say. <laughs> I, I have a sense that what we are seeing is the eruption of the shadow in a big cultural way and a lot of that is due to a lot of, is facilitated by technology we have technology that suddenly so now not, everything before was going through a few different channels the broadcasters the the mainstream media and suddenly we've democratized the media we've democratized a lot of the information and so what i see happening is that we have all of these things that were kept out of the behind closed doors or we just we, we assumed we're not part of our society anymore now erupting out of the cracks between things and beginning, I have a, beginning to erupt I, I agree I think this is just the beginning of, of something we have no idea what's coming I think we maybe have a suspicion <laughs> I don't think we do probably but but that's my sense and that's where I wonder whether what you're referring to is that same sense that we're going to have to do some serious shadow work as a culture over the next... To survive. To survive, yeah. What you're pointing to and what you're seeing with technology in, in your position as being part of the media, for the first time in human history, I have access on my cell phone 
to the great works of the greatest thinkers and, and sages of all time. Right here. Google, what did Aristotle say about this? Right here. This has never happened before. We have the ability to, to look on YouTube for all these teachings and these teachers. Never happened before. We have no idea how this is going to impact consciousness and the unconscious. <laughs> we just are in such a bold experiment. And it's going to be amazing what happens and terrifying, I suspect. I can hardly wait to see what it is. <laughs> Do you have an idea of time scales? Because things no seem time. to be accelerating very quickly. They are accelerating. There is no time. From an absolute perspective. And from a relative perspective, of course, there's this construct of time. It's a very persuasive illusion, then. It is a very pers persistent illusion. So is the self. <laughs> Most of this ego is so persistent, but it's not real. As Ramana Maharshi said, the only thing that's real is what is present in deep, dreamless sleep. <laughs> Everything else is an illusion. And illusions can kill. So can culture wars. You, you use the word culture war a couple of times now, and I think mm -hmm. this is very interesting because it seems quite clear that whatever was sparked in the 60s, the culture war that, that kind of, yeah, certainly was fueled by what happened in the 60s, seems now to me to be getting bigger and bigger. It's almost like a fractal pattern that was affecting a certain number of people in the 60s has just got bigger and bigger and bigger until it seems to be impacting the whole of culture now. You were part of, you're a little bit older than me, um, what do you make of that? Do you think these are exactly the same dynamics? And if so, what lessons do you have from your experience for how we should deal with what's happening right now? The image of a lake comes to me. In fact, it's a lake where I grew up. And it was pristine water when I grew up. And now with the global warming and with the amount of nitrates that are in the ground and have seeped into the groundwater, the, the whole lake has died with a green algae that has spread across the lake and killed all life. The postmodern culture is spreading just like your fractals, taking over from the modern culture. But my view is that what happens if it's so dysfunctional that it kills the pristine lake? It's not clear what's going to happen yet. I see the danger of that happening. The medicine for the illnesses of the postmodern egalitarian relativism, which is the ideology that's prominent now in this postmodern culture. Two medicines. One is shadow work. Two is understanding the evolution of consciousness. Because that is the next view that negates the blind spots of the pluralism. You must see that pluralism is not the answer. It's not the end. It's not those who are pluralistic or enlightened. That's just not true. That's a lie. It's just another step. It's a bigger truth than modernity, but it's not the truth. The truth is the whole thing, the whole. So this is those two things, shadow work and evolution. You, you mentioned shadow work, and that was pretty much the main topic of my first interview with Jordan Peterson. He was the first person I'd ever heard speak about it 
in a way that really resonated with me mm -hmm. in the way, because I've done sort of personal growth work probably over 12 years or so, mm -hmm. and a lot of was was built around the shadow, like integrating mm -hmm. different parts of, of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And he was the first person I'd, I'd heard speak to that in such a compelling way. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you just sort of hinted that this is the essential work. I have the same, the same feeling, mm -hmm. that the way through the, the sort of chaos of that I think is coming, and I think we all mm -hmm. recognise is coming, has to involve us all doing that really essential inner work of, of shadow integration. What does that look like? And how, how would you describe the importance of that for individuals and, I guess, that? whole society. Mm -hmm. That's a really big question. And um, I trust you to answer it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like being really fucking uncomfortable. And it's forbidden to be uncomfortable in postmodernity. You have to be nice. You can't give anybody any feedback. You can't tell the truth. You have to lie. You have to avoid negative feelings at all costs. Those all kill any real shadow work. You have to be willing not only to dive into the darkest darkness, but be really uncomfortable and see all the hideous aspects of yourself. That's the simple answer. That also sounds very difficult to achieve in an English society. <laughs> You ought to try it in a German society. I was just in Germany. <laughs> yeah. Or an American mush. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But that, that, what, I, what I love about that, and also the way you delivered it, was that, for me, is real spirituality. Yes. Anything else? This whole love and light transcendence. Can I call it bullshit? Let's call it bullshit. No, let's call it bullshit. Yeah, let's call it bullshit. Is <laughs> I, I, oh, it just, it just really irritates me. Just this whole sort of sense of that spirituality is just here up rather than here down. Because all of the v valuable work that I've done has been digging in the dirt, really going into it. And that people Dig don't want to do it. Digging in the shit, yeah. not the dirt. You got to go deeper. Of course people don't want to do it. The, the addiction in post-modernity seems to be wanting to feel good. You know, you can't do the deeper work if you're limited to feeling good. There, there was a Buddhist can we, teacher... Can we blame the baby boomers for that? No, we can't blame anybody. We have to take responsibility. Blaming won't help. Fair enough. It's part of the problem. We must take responsibility. So... In post-modernity, I, I just did some beautiful work in a shadow webinar that I, I just finished, Collective Shadows. Most interesting subject. Part two of a three-part series on shadows. The, um, the, the rescuer, the victim, and the perpetrator this is an endless cycle. In postmodernity, they are identified with the rescuer, which is really deep down, it's the savior, the archetype of the savior. Now, how deep are those roots in Christian soil? The victim is the sacrificial lamb who must be sacrificed and stay sacrificed, no redemption. And the perpetrator becomes the scapegoat that in the Talmud, the Old Testament, was loaded up with the sins of the people and chased into the desert to die. The scapegoat, the one that carried the burdens, which meant we had to, we had to account for our sins on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, my favorite holiday. <laughs> so we must add something to this tr trilogy to make it whole and complete. And what we add in Integral Zen is the witness. 
who sees everything, the whole dynamics. The rescuer keeps the victim stuck in perpetual victimhood, unable to take responsibility, and projects their own responsibility, blames the scapegoat. What happened in Germany was Hitler needed a scapegoat. Oh my, what a perfect match. What a playing out of these archetypal forces in the most hideous way. This is just one example. You know, I don't blame the Germans because genocides have never ended. There are genocides happening right now that are equally hideous. And until we get in touch with the hideous beast that breathes in the shadowy depths of our own haunted soul, individually, and stop blaming others for what is part of us, they will continue. And the weapons are getting much bigger and more deadly. As Einstein said, I don't know what weapons the Third World War will be fought with. Who knows what they have in the, in the warehouses? He said, I do know what weapons the Fourth World War will be fought with. Sticks and stones. So another lens that we've looked at or, or used to look at a lot of the cultural and the social dynamics that are going on at the moment is, is gender, masculine and feminine. And in some sense, you can look at what's going on now as kind of this dysfunctional relationship between men and women that's now been, that's sort of on, on the biggest cultural stage. And I, I have a, well, I just want to sort of ask what you, what you make of that. Do you, do you think that that's quite a, a, a useful frame to look at the world? Absolutely. It, it is a, a huge part of life. Masculine and feminine is everywhere you look. Um, if I look through a, a Jungian lens, then the animus and the anima, the relationship with the opposite sex parent is where your relationship with your soul begins. It's who you will marry. That's a continuation. That vector continues. And it becomes so important to understand and to get to the roots of that little child that inevitably gets wounded. <laughs> and masculine and feminine, for, for me, the, the confusion I would sort of simplify as we've confused equality with equivalence. So explain that for me, please. So we've, we've confused equality with sameness. Yes. That in our drive to equality, to women being able to choose their destinies for probably the, the first time since the, uh, since the, since the 60s um, and sharing spaces with men. What I think we've confused is the complementarity of masculine and feminine and, and men and women with, equality, with a sameness, mm -hmm. an assumption of sameness. Mm -hmm. And my sense from teaching men's work and, and increasingly doing polarity work mm -hmm. is that the way out is to really ground ourselves in our, in our, as men, in our masculine, to then be able to meet the inner feminine, which we also have as men, mm -hmm. and the outer feminine mm -hmm. as well. Okay. And, and it's kind of, it's, it's the, the paradox of the sacred marriage <coughs> of masculine and feminine, but that can only happen if we really go into our own biological reality. So I completely agree with what you see, what you said. And I want to add another confusing complication to that confusion that you articulated. There are really two things going on that are merged together like trauma. One is developmental. We're, we're moving from modernity to post-modernity to something that will work, whatever it is. Post-modernity is not working. It's stuck. It's not sustainable. So that's one thing that's going on. 
Then we have this battle between masculine and feminine. You know, it's like an argument that needs to be a marriage, a sacred marriage. These two things are confusing enough in themselves. But when we merge them into one mess and try to solve the one mess, it's a far bigger problem than can be solved. It's a wicked problem that has no solution. Mm. And we're stuck there. So what you're pointing to is just half of it. There's another half that is equally problematic. And the combination, and there's probably more confusion that I'm not seeing, but this makes it unsolvable with this approach. We must separate it, differentiate these two things and, and work on them independently. And you've got one of them very clearly. So let's talk about that one. <laughs> I, I understand as well that you were part of some of the early explorations of what you might call the, the men's movement. Yes. Can yes. you talk about that? Oh, be careful. <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I was part of an organization called the Mankind Project. Something happened after I became very active in the Mankind Project. Um, I had to go attend to my mother who was ill. And when I came back, there was a complete transition. This thing called multiculturalism had infiltrated the ranks. And all of a sudden, there were these, these men teaching us that we were prejudiced. And they neglected to mention the fact that they were prejudiced as well, but we could smell it. You know what they were prejudiced against? Prejudice. Everybody's but theirs. And it stunk. Still does. That's another one of the, the uh, performative contradictions of postmodernity, particularly the ideology of postmodern egalitarian pluralism. They say one thing with their mouths and say another thing with their actions. With their mouths, they're saying, I'm not prejudiced. With their actions, they're saying, I'm prejudiced against prejudice. This is a problem. This is a problem. It has no integrity. It doesn't speak the same truth. There is a shadow here that's unspoken, but felt. Is prejudice not a good thing to be prejudiced against, though? It absolutely is, of course. But you need to own the fact that you're prejudiced, and then it's not a problem. If you pretend you're not prejudiced, it stinks. That's a performative contradiction. You're lying. If you say, I, and I am prejudiced against prejudice, aren't you? Hmm. Of course. Who wouldn't be? So telling that truth and not lying about it, not pretending to be greater than somebody while pretending to be equal <laughs> is where we need to go. We need to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We need the whole truth rather than just the perfect truth that will make us appear to be enlightened and so-called equal. Perfectly equal. Is there such a thing as perfect equality? I've never experienced it. It's just an idea. And when I try to te treat people as though everybody's equal, it's such a disservice because I can't, I can't treat them for who they are. I can't treat them with respect. Respect for who they are and all their, their, their individuality. So this is a interesting, it's a moral dilemma, actually. Mm. And moral dilemmas lie at the core of culture wars. This is uh, something that Jordan Peterson says about you don't treat everyone with respect, otherwise it devalues the currency. There's something different 
Treating people with common decency is one thing. Treating everyone you meet with respect is something different because respect is earned. I have a little semantic difference in the way I would describe that. I, I get the spirit of what he's saying and I agree with the spirit. But I do go out of my way to respect everyone. This is a mark of what I would call awakened mind. Respect for everyone. The difference, what must be earned, is not respect, it's trust. This must be earned. And we're saying the same thing, different words. And would you say that you're respecting the person as they appear, or are you respecting the person who they could become? I look at you and I see Buddha. See your eyes just sparkle? You just became Buddha. This is awakened mind. That light that just sparkled in your eyes is what I see when I look in your eyes. I see all the shit too. <laughs> but that's what I respect is the Buddha. Or Christos, same thing. What is the medicine for an addiction like an addiction to ourselves, like cultural narcissism? When AA, the founders of AA, who were deeply influenced by Carl Jung, Jung gave them a secret ingredient to combat addiction. Prior to AA, alcoholism was incurable. The greatest medical minds said there is no cure for alcoholism. If you were an alcoholic, you were written off. No treatment possible. What they got from Jung that became part of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, was a realignment with something, some power that's greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is the medicine for narcissism. This is a necessary ingredient. If we can't awaken something more sacred than ourselves and the devotion to it, we're not going to survive. What I'm also sort of feeling from you as well is something that I recognize in true spirituality, which is this level of intensity. <laughs> it's, I mean, and in a way, that's what I understand. Even meditation, yes. it's like, can you be here? No, can you be really, really here? And can you be really here with all of you right now? That, for me, is the essence of all the spiritual work that I've done is can you access that level of intensity? And that means accessing all of the parts of yourself. The anger, the, yeah, the, the, everything at the same time. The whole yeah. enchilada. Yeah. So there you go sparkling again. Mm. So I've got bad news for you. <laughs> if you spot it, you've got it. You've got no choice but to become the Buddha that you already are, no matter what. And you have that intensity. Never turn away. There's worse things to happen. <laughs> oh, there's much worse things to happen. Yeah. There's fate much worse than death. But Doshin, you are a Zen master. And... There are no masters of that. There are no masters, but I've always wanted to do this. Yes. Yeah, isn't that great? That's the wrong answer. You flunked. <laughs> no. <laughs> the sparkle in your eye has already answered the correct answer for the koan. Yeah. Don't confuse the audience. <laughs> <laughs> This is one hand clapping. This is one hand clapping. What is not one hand clapping? And can you see this deep truth in all things? Oshin, <laughs> thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Anytime.